Hey, I'm Jana, the little sister. And I'm Jeff, her big brother. Welcome to Sibling Rivalry, a podcast about our favorite sport, baseball. This week on Sibling Rivalry Baseball, it's back. And we share our thoughts about the sights and sounds of opening weekend. But first, a look at the SRBB headline. Mookie Betts signs a 12-year, $365 million extension with the Dodgers. The Blue Jays have found a home, playing home games in Buffalo starting on August 11th, home of their trip. AAA affiliate. The Canadian government denied their request to play games in Toronto. The MLB and Players Union have agreed to expand the playoffs from 10 teams to 16 teams for the 2020 season. And 12 players, two coaches of the Marlins have tested positive for COVID-19, which caused the postponement of the Marlins home opener versus the Orioles, as well as the Yankees-Phillies game. You can find these and past week's headlines on our website, siblingrivalrybb.com. Remember to rate and subscribe wherever you listen and tell a friend to listen to the Sibling Rivalry Baseball Podcast. It is indeed back. I was a little worried about this, but things have come together. Although, based on some recent news, it seems like things might be starting to fall apart but we're not there yet so let's just focus on the opening weekend of baseball and some of our first impressions on what we saw in uh, pandemic ball 2020 espn announcers are still terrible (laughs) they are and you know what the first thing i thought about in fact it was probably the very first thing i wrote down when watching the nationals yankees game was that baseball needs to do whatever they can to secure A-Rod's buying the Mets so that he will never be an announcer on ESPN again, ever. Now, I will say... That sounds sounds good to me. I I will say that, and and it's kind of funny when you think about it, when you listen to the announcers, and and they were were terrible overall, and I like Matt Vaskersian, who was with him. It wasn't even just them. It was all ESPN announcers on all their games were bad. But on the Sunday night game with the, the Dodgers and Giants, he was a rod, although he's hard to listen to, was very complimentary of the Dodger organization and Dodger Stadium and, and all of that. And it made me at that point, I was like, oh, OK. And it made me think when they're talking good about your team, OK. I'm fine. Yeah, I did feel that same way. And I liked that how he said he uh, had a hard time hitting at Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium was not kind to him. Yes. Um, but even Matt Baskersian was checked out of the game because he said the only thing keeping him in the game was to see how many put out that Mookie Betts could get in right field, which I think he had eight or nine. Nine, nine that um, I remember. And, That's the last yeah, time and, I heard him say, <clears throat> and it was right around the same time that he said eight or nine was when he mentioned that. I, I remembered that line and thought about that too. <laughs> yeah. It was like, that's the only thing keeping me in this game. It's like, Come on. That's see. And that's one of those things where where we always talk about all the things that people don't like about baseball. And when even a guy who works for MLB, when even he says, "Eh, I'm I'm just here so to see if Mookie can break, you know, Tony Armas's record for the most putouts in a game. Right. Yeah. Well, and I think that goes to they talked about not having the fans there and that was one thing i noted is you're watching the game it's nice to have baseball back but there's no energy okay but when you go to work at your own work (laughs) now okay and maybe not you so much because you went when you were working you went to a school and maybe there's some parallel here that teachers are getting ready to go back and in a lot of places there are going back to online instruction and some places that means a teacher's in front of a class all day like a regular schedule just online and some are actually going to have you know in-person classes so i'm sure there's a difference between having distance learning and having the students right in front of you there is so i there is a good that is a good parallel because when you're online with students Sometimes a student doesn't have the video on. You don't even know if they're there. You have one student who might be participating. 
And so, but even Ross Stripling mentioned that, you know, coming out from the bullpen, the fans are yelling or, you know, hey, you know, go get him, Ross, or whatever. And so that's gone. But, I mean, I, I'm not going to complain because baseball's back. So, well, but I that's still would like I, to see fans. You did. Then you watched the game on Fox on Saturday, the Dodger I game. Did. And there were fans that- there. Digital that fan. actually was really cool. The only thing I didn't like was when they did the wave, which I don't like when they do it in, in like person. real. <laughs> yeah. So I was like, don't do the wave. But it actually was really cool. And I wish that those cutouts weren't there because then it would have been even cooler. I, I Yeah, I think that that probably took away. The one thing that threw me off, though, was one minute they'd show it and like they were showing like the outfield. And you saw it full of people. And my first thought was because at the beginning of the game, they didn't, they weren't doing that. And as the game went on, then they'd have the digital crowd out there. But when I, the first time I saw it, I thought, wow, they got a lot more cutouts out there in the outfield. Then I realized it was the digital thing, but they got to find a way so that the crowd's always there. When they go to another angle, you could see it was all empty. So that to me was I, and I don't know if that's a hard thing for them to do. I don't know, you know, what their what the technology is to put that in place. But if they're going to do it, it needs to be that way. It needs to look like a sellout the whole game, not just certain camera angles. They got to figure out how it's. It doesn't matter what camera it's looking at. That's superimposed out there in the stadium. The A's they had cutouts. They have that big cutout of Tom Hanks selling hot dogs, which is just kind of, to me, was weird. But then they have, like, teddy bears. So is that for well, something? I that. Well, I, that was the one thing I, I, I got because in one area, like, uh, one of the games, a uh, player came over to catch a ball over on the, uh, the left field line. And there was a couple of teddy bears and a bunch of elephants. And the elephants I got, because that's part of their logo. That's always been, the elephant's been an athletics logo since Philadelphia, since Mm -hmm. the beginning of the athletics. That one I got. The teddy bears I didn't, but they're all over the place. What I did find funny was, was that uh, one of the coaches for the Angels, I think he's the quality assurance coach, sat up in the middle of like some of the cutouts and put Angels sweatshirts or (laughs) t-shirts on some of them and and angels gear first thought was was like okay and then somebody uh on one of the broadcasts said i bet the people who paid the money for those are probably mad because they're covered <laughs> up by angels gear oh, the that, of all the places and we'll and we'll talk more about you know the angels and a series uh in a bit but that was the one thing of all of the stadiums with the cutouts, the A stadium just looked messy. Well, they had homemade signs that were strange. I guess it was to be more homey or well, I, more I saw realistic. That and I thought about but that, but there's it it's reminded a, me of elementary school. <laughs> it's an old stadium. They are the cheapest team in the league. I was like watching that and I thought, okay, that's just not. Now I did like they would have. Like there was a cutout of Raleigh Fingers. There was a cutout of Ron Darling and some of the different A's players. I saw one where they had some older players and I didn't identify them right away, like 20s, 30s era athletics. So they had like a cutout with three of them together. They had some of those. Those were kind of cool, but there's just something about that stadium. And then when they looked in the dugout, When you looked at other places, if they had something on the bench about where to be, and I noticed too, like the Dodgers, they had gaps and then they had um, towels for each player that had their number on it. And those were set in the places where they could sit. The A's in their dugout, which is an old cruddy dugout, somebody just took red tape and X'd out areas. Don't sit here. It's like the makeshift marking to let you know there was a reason not to sit there. It just looked bad. And it just looked junky and messy. Well, I will say with the cutout, one thing that was uh, cool, like 
it say it happened because a guy almost lost his head was at Dodger Stadium when Will Smith hit that home run. So, saw yeah. on Twitter, too, that uh, the guy said, do I get something? And Will Smith <laughs> responded, told him, hey, get DM me and I'll, I'll hook you up. <laughs> yeah. But I'd say, that's what I thought the cool thing about having it was with some places, not everybody's doing this with those, but that, the, that if the ball hits your cutout, you get the ball. Which yeah, yeah. I thought that's the reason to do it if you're going to do it. Honestly, after watching the first two days, Thursday opening day games, where I got to see, you got to see both sides of it. The Nationals Park, they didn't have any cutouts. They chose not to. And they allowed the, that whole area open. So if the players wanted to go sit behind plate and stretch out and social distance, which we can get into in a second, but they um, they left that open. And then, and then like Dodger Stadium, where you had all of those, it was on Sunday where I was uh, watching the MLB tonight where they were going game to game and they had the ML, they had Brian Kenny and Pedro Martinez and they had the whole staff there as part of the cutouts. So they, you know, they've created different, different cutouts. Some of them are fun. That was one thing that you, you mentioned Tom Hanks at the A's, the A's put in, they had a, one of their vendors right before the, the on Friday night, I was watching the pregame ceremonies and they did a in memoriam thing of all the different players and and A's personnel who had passed away in the past year. And one of them was a hot dog vendor. And they have a they have a big cut out of him with his rig that I, I, I like that. There's little things like that. I love the dogs, but honestly, by Saturday, in fact, honestly, by the end of Friday night. I knew I didn't want to see any more cutouts. I like the open stadium with nothing. I kind of just tuned out the crowd noise. And I know the Dodgers, they had it so loud that the Dodger players said, no, you got to turn it down. It's too loud. And so some of that I didn't really even think of. I, I, I'd like to hear more of the sounds. Like in uh, Pittsburgh, where uh, pitcher Derek Holland got thrown out of the game. <laughs> he was sitting in the stands. And he was in the stands. They were. Everybody <laughs> thought it was uh, the manager, Shelton, Derek Shelton, who was getting thrown out. And that was a one of those things in, about um, social distancing was that Shelton, the manager of the Pirates, came out, pulls up. He's got one of those gator scarf things on. He pulled his up. And on the way over, the umpire reached in to find his mask. And one side had broken off the the elastic so he was holding it up but as they came together they were almost going to stand like they normally do close and the pirates manager backed off a couple of steps and at that point i'm like all right you guys are on it and you yeah. know what i i don't really care if you know because we were talking about obviously with all the news about the marlins you know you saw it i saw it there was a lot of not social distancing going on well i was thinking about mound visits because we had talked about previously in an episode when we we're talking about okay these are all the things that have to happen and how were they going to do six feet mound visits and we saw that they did not do six feet mound visits they were all right there now i mean they had their gloves up over their face but they normally have their gloves up over their face so i don't know if right, they, that they, is something they need to work on or well, I, I saw very few players. There were a few that wore mask continually. You'd see them. They were up to bat with a mask on. There weren't many. What's his name? Pablo Sandoval. He always had a mask on, but most of the time it was pulled down around his chin. We did see him pull it up a couple of times. There were some times I know that uh, Matt Olson after all the Marlin stuff was announced, said, I'm going to keep a mask with me so if somebody gets to first base. But we saw high fives. We saw all the things they said they weren't going to do. They said, don't throw the ball around. And there were times where there was a strikeout and they just threw it back to the pitcher. And then there were times that they threw it around. It was inconsistent. Yeah, and I think, too, it's things that you are so used to doing that it's hard 
not to do it. Like you have to get into another routine because like, oh, oh man, I threw the ball, you know, or oh, I right. didn't do this or oh, I high five. I did like Anthony Rizzo that had hand sanitizer in his back pocket and that offered it to the, the you yeah, know, the players the that came on to thing. first base. Brewer player uh, gets there, he's like, hey, need a little uh, <laughs> squeeze some in. The player took his, yeah. he had just taken his batting gloves off. Yep, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I did like that. And leave it to Anthony Rizzo. He is one of my favorite uh, ball players. I, he's always what? fun to watch. He's going to be he's going to be a free agent just as Albert Pujols' contract with the Angels expires. He'd be a good angel. And I would love to see him. And he could reunite with Joe Madden. Exactly. We could get him there. I mean, I like the Cubs. I'm fine with the Cubs. I, he's one. He's one of those. There's always a player that you can kind of like. Like I don't like. I really don't like any of the Giants, but I did like uh, Dubon, the new kid, the Hond- first Honduran to ever play in the major leagues. And I think it's because he's young and because he's he's like those players where they're smiling, they're happy to be there, and he's just excited, like he's living the dream. Yeah, and he'll play wherever I had heard he was. I think he was groomed for center field, or they were putting him in center field. But then, and that's where he was expected to play. But then he played, I think the first game he played second base and shortstop. You know, he's kind of game for anything. But yeah, he always is smiling. And he just has a look of wonder on his face. Like, yeah, I can't believe I'm here kind of thing, which is cool. So yeah, if I had to pick one player from each team and I had to pick a giant. I would agree with you on that one. Yeah, the only uh, team that I'm not picking anybody from is the Asterix. Yeah, we don't have to pick anyone no. from there. A couple other things that I noticed with the with the games on opening day on the Thursday or Friday games, when they when they were they were they're trying to, you know, do all the announcements and some of the in game stuff that they would normally do on on that first game it, it was very, they were showing the players as they're being introduced. It seemed kind of awkward. They were like, what do we do? You're not waving to the crowd or tipping your hat to the crowd. I think at one point the Dodgers were kind of pointing towards the outfield and I never caught what was going on with that. I'm glad that part of it's over so that they could just go in, start the game. I don't think that they really need to have all those extra things. It, it appreciate. I think the players appreciate what they're missing more than before but going back to it that that you 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 don't realize how much you let the crowd pump you up and motivate you but it's your job that's true you know we don't all have somebody cheering for us most people don't (laughs) there's not a crowd when you walk into your office job whatever it is or wherever you work do you ever see stands set up on the highway for the uh (laughs) for the road workers guys out there digging holes, working in the hot. There's not people out there cheering them on. Dig that hole. Dig that <laughs> hole. Change that pipe. No, they're not. They're not. No, boring. they're probably getting yelled at. They're mad because they're like you know, umpires. That pothole. Open these lanes. Open these lanes. <laughs> That's right. I will say the DH, we talked about the DH being, of course, in the AL, but now in the NL and I was like, no, you know, that's the distinction, but I can handle it this year. I think it might be a possibility. And if it means that Justin Turner can stay with the Dodgers, then yeah, I'm all for it. But it didn't bother me as much. It did bother me on certain players who were the DH. And we'll talk about that in the Dodger segment. (laughs) All right. One last thought, and we'll do just that. Uh, actually, two last thoughts, and we'll do that. Number one, was it wrong when ESPN was talking to Rob Manfred, who was at the game, who was at the, who was there at the Nationals Park, and it got rained out. It became an official game because they had played over the five-inning mark. While they're interviewing him, behind him, there's nothing but the sky is just lit up with lightning. And all I could think of was... Strike Manfred. Is it wrong that I was waiting for the lightning to hit Rob? I don't think so because I think there are a lot of uh, fans and maybe even some other people closer to MLB that might have been thinking the same thing. 
Yeah, he just needed to hold up his uh, kite. He needed to be outside, he though. Needed, he not... needed that. <laughs> we needed him to do his Ben Franklin impersonation. Yes, yes. And I don't know how you were, but by Saturday, watching the games, and the greatest thing happened to me was my cell provider, I have Sprint. Well, Sprint and T-Mobile are together, and T-Mobile offers MLB TV as part of their package so now i get mlb tv so i sat watching whatever game was on tv and then had two or three other games going between other devices yes. and by saturday afternoon it was like it hadn't been gone to me right it was there i was immersed in it and i didn't feel like there it is like oh my god you know i, I still got to get used to this and built up to it I could see some things and we could talk about those more as we, as we get deeper into these, but that was the one thing was like, Hey, Manfred struck by lightning <laughs> and baseball, baseball was back for me fully with no, no hesitation, no second thoughts by Saturday afternoon. If probably, probably by Friday, halfway through or by the, by the time the rain started in DC, <laughs> I was, was fully in because it was that was a great game. Yeah, and I will say going back to that game, we do have to mention Dr. Fauci. He cannot get away from his opening pitch. He uh, took some lessons from uh, Fifty Cents, I understand, and uh, he did really well because he he, almost he obviously exactly. learned. Yes. Well, I saw a so. thing the other day that said that the people were missing out, missing what happened there was, was that Dr. Fauci's uh, job is to keep people away from the virus. And that being his job, he also kept the ball away from the catch. <laughs> So it's just his okay. job. I don't know. He's 77 years old. He was very excited. I saw him asked about it in different things. And you could see what happened. He needed Benny the Jet Rodriguez to tell him where to release it. Like, oh, it's like throwing a paper because he held it too long. And as he came down, which was, should have been the follow through, that's when he let go too late. Right. And I can imagine if I were ever to uh, throw out a first pitch at Dodger Stadium, I might have the same outcome. <laughs> I well, practice it would be a lot, cool. though. It would be cool to see. <laughs> it would be. It's time for Dodger baseball. So for Dodger fans, we got early opening day. Everybody else had to wait till Friday. The Dodgers and the Giants started things out on Thursday night. And from the Dodger perspective, it was a good game. It was, it was awesome. Great game. Yeah, I mean, it was, you had... They were playing in all these games. They're playing this Jack in the Box commercial. And there's one that just, I love it every time I see it. And, and this was the deal. The Dodgers on Thursday came out being the best. And as they say in the commercial, it's about to get bester, baby. <laughs> And really, on Thursday and Friday, that was it. They were bester than the best. Yeah, then they got worster. <laughs> worster. <laughs> I mean, Saturday wasn't too bad. Uh, Sunday was ridiculous. But uh, first game, yeah, great game. Kike Hernandez and his mustache were the players of the game. I, I told you the other day, and I still think this, Kike, great player. The stash is a Hall of Famer. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, I mean, he went four for five. He had a two-run home run. Um, he had five RBIs. He's the only other second baseman with five or more RBIs on opening day. Joe Morgan did that in 1978 with the Cincinnati Reds. So that is good company to keep. Yeah. Absolutely. That's Hall of Fame company right there. You know, yeah. the person who was not enjoying Kike's, now he wouldn't say it, but the guy who was not enjoying Kike's performance on Friday, who? Gavin Lux. Definitely. Yes. He was sent to the kiddie pool and <laughs> is there for a while, I think, with yeah. uh, his uh, display. Yeah, we not only his display, but Kike's display probably did more to keep Gavin in the kiddie pool 
than it did. Kike was going to be there anyway, but yeah. now he's in a position where he's going to be he's going to be there unless the wheels come off his bus. And and obviously a lot of things can happen because on Thursday before just before game time, the Dodger world kind of got shook up a little bit when it was announced that Clayton Kershaw was going on the IL. For the with, second uh, year in a row, he's missed opening day due right. to back yep. issues. And I did realize when I was watching the game, and he had a ton of commercials, Clayton Kershaw. So one is the Skecher commercial, and I thought Clayton Kershaw is officially old. He has the Skechers footwear commercial where you've got like John Elway in previous, you know, other right. guys and, that are retired. Right. The retired. Well, <laughs> you know, even in my house we're and we're, you know, much older than Clayton. Uh, ooh, those look comfortable. <laughs> got that. Oh, we're like the, we're like the, you know, the, uh, the commercial with the, the folks who, you know, they bought their first house. So they're more like their parents. That was like, the feeling was like, Ooh, <laughs> These are comfort well, and then, issues. And comfort's more important than looking good. That's right. And then Planet Head was watching the game with me. He said he's now an official baseball uh, widow, but I think he's more widower. <laughs> um, I think and he's, he's a widow. I think there's something he's, <laughs> he's a widow. Telling <laughs> and uh, I said Clayton Kershaw's out. You know, with the back injury, he's supposed to start. Well, then the Han the Hankook uh, Hankook uh, tire commercial came on. And he said, that's why his back is out, because he's driving all those cars and jumping over things in the well, Jeep. Yeah, the way that he lands in the Jeep. He's like, but the one that, that I thought was probably closer, I think, was the Skechers commercial when he's in the suit of armor. Yes. And I'm sure he's not the one in the suit of armor when it falls over and he's laying on the ground. But still, that's a lot of pressure on those areas. <laughs> And who yeah, got him in so, the weight room? What was he lifting in the weight room that yeah. he hurt his back? He did. Was there not a strength and conditioning coach in there to tell him that was wrong form? He snuck in a, and snuck in when he wasn't supposed to, I guess, in his Skechers. And where That's was the Charlie? problem. Yeah, he was, he was wearing his Skechers. <laughs> Charlie wasn't there to spot him. No, that was that's probably the problem. But while Clayton Kershaw's on the IL, someone who was going to be in the kiddie pool went right to the deep end, and that's Dustin May, and he looked really good in that now, first game. He did, and he became the first rookie to start for the Dodgers since 1981 which was another weird season because we had the mid-season strike in 1981. The only difference between these two pitchers, these two rookie, rookie pitchers is Dustin May didn't get the win, but Fernando Valenzuela did get the win back in 1981 and carried that team to an eventual world championship. Yeah, and during that first game, I mean, Dustin May, he pitched 4.1 innings. He had seven hits. Uh, there was one earned run, but he had four strikeouts. So overall, it was a good showing, especially for someone who was told, okay, you're going to the kiddie pool and now you're back in, in it. And, and now he did you're well starting. Yeah, now you're on opening day, which has got to be um, a little nerve wracking, I would think. Adam Kolarik, he did get the win and he wore his spring training summer warm-up hat so those are different because it has like arizona on the side i was yeah. looking at that going and i started looking because i was liking that hat and of course yeah. everywhere was sold out so <laughs> but he wore that hat in the first game i think he should continue wearing it because he got the win and had the two strikeouts in a good showing in his he one he looked, inning that he, he pitched don't... Overall, the the pitching didn't look bad. The Giants, even for winning the last two games, was less about the pitching and more about the lack of offense. It's like the first two games, what was the 17 to two uh, yeah. was the score in the first two games. <clears throat> The Giants didn't score. The, uh, the Sunday night game was the most. They scored three runs. That was the most they scored in the, in the series, right? 
No, Saturday they oh it they was, scored uh, five five. Yeah, yeah, it was five to four. There were points where where the Dodger hitters, especially on Sunday night, were hitting the ball hard. Cody Bellinger, one hit there, which the first baseman was right in place to get, but he hit it hard. And it wasn't that they weren't putting the, the bat on the ball in places. They were hitting it right at people. Yeah, and the singles, they were, they were hitting singles, and that was on both sides. So yeah, it was... Like, it was yeah, yeah. Point, there was uh, 15 hits in the game and they were all singles. In fact, it wasn't until AJ Pollock got up and he hit a double off the wall that, which oddly enough, who's the guy who gets it? Yeah, AJ, AJ Pollock. Pollock. You know, that was the, that was the first uh, and only extra base hit in that game. Yeah. And in the second game, Max Muncy was the star and he was three for four. He had two home runs, so he had a multi-home run game. Ross Stripling came in. He looked really good. He pitched seven innings, had four hits, uh, one earned run, no base on balls, and uh, seven strikeouts. So, so he was making his his case he for was. why he should be in there because at the beginning, he you know, if not for David Price opting out, Stripling starts off in the bullpen. Of course, that probably would have changed things if Kershaw went out. Stripling probably would have been the day one starter instead of Dustin May. But when you compare Stripling's start to Alex Wood, who was announced as a starter, Stripling looked like the ace. Alex Wood looked like maybe he should be in the kiddie pool working on something. He definitely does. I, you know, I like Alex Wood. I want to root for him. I really do. And I thought... Coming back to the Dodgers, it would like reinvigorate him. I know he had a rough time last season. He had back issues with Cincinnati and was on the IL for a long time. But he was the same old guy that we had seen before. And that when he did get traded to the Reds, it wasn't that big of a deal. Now we have him back. And it's like, okay, why do we have him back? Right. Because there were moments back when he was with the Dodgers where you saw him and said, great. But when they traded him, I didn't think anything of it. Yeah, Alex Wood was uh, three, lasted three innings. And over those three innings, there were three hits, three runs, three walks, four strikeouts. Not a good line at all. No, so he's he, got, he does need to probably go back to the kiddie here's, pool. And here's the problem that we know. We heard it, if you watched any game, probably was mentioned in almost every game and definitely on the highlight shows. This is a sprint, not the marathon. Alex Wood maybe gets a little longer rope if it's game one of 162. We'll talk about Shohei Otani coming up with the Angels, and he may have gotten more opportunity uh, on his start on Sunday, if it's a longer season. The problem is, and this is one thing that I liked, and I think it's because he used a term that we've used. Ron Darling on MLB said, we know it's not a marathon. We're calling it, people are calling it a sprint. I call it survivor, survival. Yes. And, and because we saw it, it's really going to be that. And we've seen it that, you know, this opening weekend showed us that right now everybody's clustered together. And yeah, no team is three and oh. The one the team that everybody would have probably bet money on to be undefeated, or maybe the two teams to be undefeated, the Dodgers were number one. They expect especially because of who they were playing. The Giants, which is a hodgepodge of there was so much talk about how Gabe Kapler wasn't submitting the starter or the lineup until like a minute before game time. Right. And Dave Roberts called that gamesmanship. I think Gabe Kapler just didn't have a clue. He just did no, not know until so. that moment. But, and, and what's working for him is, is that he's got a couple of guys out there who are like, as we talked about Dubon. And I heard that he learned more about the outfield from watching videos than actually playing the outfield. They were talking about that, I think, on Sunday night. He's got to figure that out. And the guys that he would normally have that would be the, the big players, Evan Longoria being one of them, out of there. Buster Posey, who is the face and the captain of that team, opting out. So he doesn't have those. What's his name? Crawford, which something happened with Crawford on, uh, on opening night, and they pulled him. 
And they well, think that there's issues between him and Kapler right. that created that. But that's that's one of your guys that's your, you know, he's he's one of the veterans of that team. Well, and he was the only player on opening night that was also on the opening day roster last year. He was the only one because Brandon Bell is out, Evan Longoria is out, Johnny Cueto, who pitched opening night, he was out last year, but he probably wouldn't have pitched last year. If he had pitched, he wouldn't have been the opening starter. It probably would have been uh, Bumgarner, and Bumgarner's gone. So, right. and an interesting stat about Johnny Cueto is he has one of the lowest ERAs of an opening day pitcher of 0.64. That really surprised me. I like Johnny Cueto. He's quirky. And I do miss him not being able to bat. I do. I like to see him bat because he swings around and he's, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's, a, he's definitely a character. And it would have been interesting because Clayton Kershaw on opening day starts has a 1.05. Yeah. So you got those two guys, and and honestly, it wasn't until uh, deeper into the game with Cueto that the that the Dodgers actually started to get to him. They had loaded the bases up later. It was they did the bulk of their damage to the bullpen, not to Johnny Cueto. He pretty much controlled them to start. And in the opening, Dustin May did well. He gave up some base hits, but he he was solid. Johnny Cueto was better at the beginning, but it really felt like the Giants were gonna were gonna fall off. But the Dodgers, I think a lot of people were surprised that they weren't four and zero, and then at least three and one. Yeah, the Dodgers made some mistakes on the base pads, um, especially on the game three, the Saturday game. I, you know, it's like, come on, Dino, you got to get those guys out there running some base base running oh, yeah, drills because drills. Taylor, it wasn't. Yeah, that, Chris that, Taylor. That there. Now, maybe he was still shook up after his encounter with the panda. <laughs> well, yeah, and that was an unfortunate. Yeah, he almost got sat on by the panda. <laughs> Wished. <laughs> you know, by the panda. Yeah, so Chris Taylor. Austin Barnes, which, you know, you look at Dodger Twitter, it's like, oh, you know, Austin Barnes, he doesn't need to be in there. But he's a good catcher, and I like him. Like I said, he's the cuz, so. Uh, but he made a base running air. Justin Turner made a base running air. Corey Seager made base running airs. Yep. And it was like, what is going on? And they all had that look when they got tagged out. Like, they knew <laughs> – like, what just happened? What did I just do? Why, why did I do that? For sure. Yeah. And that's the question, though, is do you think that the summer warm-up time being as short as it was, the layoff where you're throwing and hitting maybe, but you're not really doing any base running drills and things like that, had an effect on that? I think so, because when you have those drills, it's hard to do base running drills by yourself. You've got to have somebody that's going to tag you out or, you know, be there. You can't hitting and, and fielding because you can have somebody field the ball to you. That's a lot easier. But yeah, these the drills that are the little league drills and things that you learn at the beginning when you start playing, those, those things were on display as yeah, the Dodgers really need to do some work work there. Because it wasn't just, like I said, mentioning, you know, some of the players like, is okay, you know, Chris Taylor made a base running air or Austin Barnes made it. It was the bigger, it was Justin, Ta uh, Justin Turner. It was Corey Seager that were doing. I mean, the only one that was really great on the base pads was uh, Mookie Betts. And he was... even, when he got uh, that... Giants pitcher balked. I can't think of his name, but he he balked and he took off running to second base, which normally oh, yeah. most people just kind of jog. It was like he was going to steal second and he was going to take third. It's going to be a two base balk <laughs> right there. Yeah, yeah. I saw I saw him do that. You know, with the bat, he's hit the ball decently, but just at people on the base pass, sliding into home. And that one time, he got in there. He he's very quick. So he got in there, got the his hand in the right place. I saw guys throughout the weekend on different games. Like there was one, uh, and I don't remember the guy from Atlanta, 
but the the Braves, he's sliding into third, but the way that he slid, his feet and his legs were way out behind the bag. And then so he was he was only was gonna be able to get it with his hand. He beat the ball there, but because of the way he slid, had he put his foot there and stopped him there, he would have been safe, but they got him because yeah. of that. Um, well, the, the way thing. that Buki did it, he made sure his hand was in the right spot and he and he got there. There was a lot yeah. of bad tags. The Dodgers had a couple. What was it uh, with Kike? All right. Well, the ball came had he swept back like they're trained to do. And I've seen him do before. Runners out. But instead, yeah. he picked it up and then tried to put it down again. Right. And he didn't he didn't do those those basics. And so I think, yeah, I think that we'll see across the board, but definitely saw in this uh, opening weekend with the Dodgers that there are some things that they need to work on. They are, they're a great team, but you saw, like you said, Mookie Betts, uh, he was hitting, but he was hitting right to people and he's hitting hard. Bellinger, same thing. He was hitting and he had a couple of good hits, but then it would be hard hit. And then you'd get out. Two weird things. Well, one funny thing. And then the weird thing. I've heard Jocelyn, Jock Peterson, use profanity before. But everybody heard it. So much uh, so that Carl Ravage (laughs) called it out. Yes. About the fact that I heard it. I didn't think anything of it. And had I been doing it, I wouldn't have called any attention to it. Yeah. Yeah. He said said an expletive. (laughs) Which was kind of funny the way he described it. favorite buzzword. Yes, he grounded out. So Jocelyn grounded out in the sixth inning, was very upset. Now, I've heard him say it before. I've heard it in in the dugout. And I just know that's that's just him. And the random helium balloon that drifted into Dodger Stadium was so odd it was so weird later i heard that i don't know if somebody called into 570 and said yeah that was my balloon i don't know if i believe him it seems kind of strange but i know that sometimes you know people will put it because it was like a birthday balloon had candles on it i think People, you know, release balloons, especially loved ones who have passed away and they're wishing them happy birthday. And, and maybe that's what happened. To the or north, Dustin May. To the, to the <laughs> north, maybe. That could have been it. By the way, for those who don't know what 570 is, AM 570 is a local uh, radio station and it's uh, the Dodgers station. Yes. So. You shouldn't mention that. Well, it it also having that balloon come into Dodger Stadium seemed perfect because what stops games at least, well, more than once during Dodger games is the dreaded beach ball. So the beach ball couldn't be there, but a helium balloon could make its way in. So maybe they were in cahoots, the beach ball and the balloon. I can do it. The spirit of baseball. That's right. That's right. I will say on the DH for the Dodgers, we knew that Justin Turner would be a DH. Uh, Matt Beatty, which we didn't see. Chris Taylor, Max Munsey, they were all going to take a turn. And then you have A.J. Pollock in there. And he was a des- you know he was the DH, and I just didn't get that because... Pollock is Pollock and he hasn't changed and he's the same guy and I maybe he and then he got the double and it's like yeah we're gonna get a rally because when he comes up to bat I'm always like all right it's an out but he got the double and you would have thought look I got a double bring me in it was the opposite maybe they didn't want to bring him in (laughs) <laughs> because it, how many times have they had something, start something, he comes up, gets out, and then they continue the rally right. without him. So he once started, he got on, it was an opposite. I think it was the opposite effect there, yeah, which is unfortunate. But I will say something really uh, good for the Pollock family is that their daughter, Maddie, was able to come home from the hospital after being in the hospital for 128 days. So congratulations to the Pollock family and her continued growth because she's really cute. But her dad shouldn't be a DH. (laughs) 
And, you know, the Dodgers, speaking of the base pads, and this is something that has plagued them throughout their runs other seasons. But just in these games, these four games, they left 42 base runners. Wow. That's, yeah, that's a lot. It's a lot. And and when you, you're only playing 60 games, you can't do that in a series. It just, it's not going to work. No, not at all. And so the Dodgers are two and two after that series, after opening, after opening day. And I have seen where people are like, you know what? It's okay because 2018, and we were at opening day 2018, Giants beat them one to nothing. Totally different Giants team. They didn't have a good opening start that season and kind of were in the same spot. So maybe they have Mookie from the Red Sox. The Red Sox went to beat, it's like 10 degrees of separation. Mookie, <laughs> he won, he, they won the, the, the World Series. Now Mookie's on the Dodgers. Maybe it could it could be a good omen for the Dodgers to not have come out four and zero or three and one. I I agree on one side of it. You hear a lot of people saying, you know, now that their start was not what we thought, and everybody you got to get off strong. And this is across the board, every team. But what we what we're seeing is is everybody's got a loss, at least one, some with two. I think we're gonna have to look at this and not get too crazy about I know it's 60 games but like Ron Darling said it's about survival it's less about sprinting it out and more about okay now we know what's happened how do we adjust to the things that are wrong how do we fix this how do we do this is this player gonna is are they slumping okay we don't have time for them to slump send them to the kiddie pool or limit their time on the field Mm Because you can't keep sending them up to bat if they're not doing anything. Right. Yeah. And And I think this, this, uh, this weekend, like you said, for all of the teams was really almost like auditions in a way. I mean, there are going to be certain players that will always be on the roster, but there are also those auditions, the giants, especially because they're going to have to make, you know, cuts and uh, those guys know it. And so who's going to stay? And so for teams like the Giants, it was kind of, I think, like an audition. For the Dodgers, who's up to speed? Who can uh, who can play the game and who needs uh, some more rehab, warm-up time? Well, for the second year in a row, the Angels started the season in Oakland. And I've already talked about just how run down and shoddy that stadium is. The one thing that the A's do have that I didn't think about was that now they have more space to spread people out because the Raiders aren't there anymore. So the Raiders locker room and the opposing football team's locker rooms are open so they could spread people out. Now, whether they're doing that or not, I don't know. But I will say this. I'm not an A's fan, but I do like the A's better than I like the Giants. And I like the A's better than I like the Astros, for sure. (laughs) If any team deserves a new stadium and to have the support of the city they're in, the A's are that team. They brought championships there. They play through with no money and make things work and win nearly 100 games a lot of seasons. So they deserve that. They deserve a new stadium. And just looking at it, it just, and I think, If there's people there, you look at it differently. But because there's no people, you focus more on things that just are so antiquated and and old. And that that's the one thing. And it when you look at that, you don't expect the A's to be as good as they are. True. Yeah. The the A's outdated. And the first night, I'll tell you, Friday night, Twitter. Baseball Twitter is in mid-season forms for all teams. Every little thing that somebody does wrong, even for the for the teams that were doing things right, somebody had an issue with it. But I don't know how many times that I saw on Twitter or heard from other folks, it's time for Albert Pujols to retire. It's time for this to stop happening. There was a lot of that. The first game out, honestly, my first thoughts on the first game out, Angels look the same. They've got a great lineup, but they're not hitting. The pitching was just... Now, Andrew Haney started out game one. Quick hook on him, four and two-thirds inning. But he actually looked like he was pitching better. 
than that. And he could have probably stayed in a little longer. The Angels worked hard. They did tie the game, but they had to really, really put a lot of effort in to get the runs across. It wasn't easy. And that's kind of what I want to see. Like the Dodgers, first two games out, they scored runs like you just turned the faucet on. And there was other teams that had that. We saw some games over the weekend. The Braves yeah, just beat the daylights out of them. And, and, the, and the Twins over the White Sox on Sunday. Uh, seven RBIs for Nelson Cruz. And we'll, we'll get into that later as well. But they weren't like that. There was, no, there was no flow to it. The guys were coming up. It was like it really felt like the end of July when the players are tired and they're, they're you know, they're just – grind him out because it's hot. There's been a long season already. It felt more like that than the opening day. I guess it felt a little like that too, because, you know, at the beginning, your timing's off, but I just felt like they were, the pitching was poor. They missed opportunities. They had the bases loaded three different times and couldn't get anything in. They couldn't get a run in. I have another uh, confession to make on <laughs> SRBB. I normally uh, watch only the Dodgers games. I will I will look in on some other games, but I don't. I usually make time just for Dodger games. On Friday night, I did start watching the Angels game. Not at the beginning because I was watching the Dodgers game, and I normally don't do that. And so I'm pretty sure that I jinxed it because when I started watching, they were up two to one. And then I thought, I'm not going to watch it anymore. I'm not gonna, and I can't watch this because then it was uh, tied. And I kind of wanted to see what the extra innings would look like. And I really quickly turned it back on and then I turned it off again. So I'm sorry to Angels Nation that the Angels lost that first game on account of me because I jinxed it. Because I normally, I will watch the the highlights of games because I really, a lots of times have time for one game and that's the Dodgers. Sorry. I, um, you know, I, I did blame you. <laughs> I, and I kind of, I knew I you kinda, would. Well, you know, what's interesting is, though, is that Blanca blamed herself because uh -oh. right towards the end of the game, before before Matt Olson came to bat, she said, OK, because we were watching in our front room, she was ready to move to the back. And uh, and our older dog, she like gets to a point where, you know, it's not we're, why are we still out here? It's time to go to the back. <laughs> so she got up and and did all that stuff and the minute she left matt olson cranks one out and it's over now we do have uh the answer to the trivia question who was the first player to and and the first game and first player to have the runner on second base in an actual game and that answer is shohei otani on second base to start the game and yeah. I have to admit that in that game, it was a it was a base running error on Shohei's part, but it was a good idea and a play by the A's that when the ball came to Matt Olson was at first base, instead of trying to get the out at first on the on the uh, the ground ball, he shot he threw the ball to third base because Shohei was running, right, and they got him in a rundown. It could have gone sideways. And honestly, based on how things went, we probably would have got a run had Shohei stayed on there because we did get another base hit after that. And Shohei's pretty fast. So he would have been the first player to score a run after being on second base in extra innings as well. That, however, goes to Marcus Simeon, who in the next inning was driven in by a grand slam by Matt Olson, who became well, only the third player to ever hit a grand slam on opening day. And, and I wonder, and, is that something we talked about drills? Is that something that the teams thought about? Did they, they put did. somebody on second? There was more of that working out that than there was on basic base running, I think. And 
those were those things. Their brains were not in the game. Now, a lot of people want to blame it on the on the crowd, but if you're a professional, it doesn't matter whether you're playing. The one thing that A Rod was correct about in in my mind, I mean, he's correct about a few things, but the one thing that he was saying that I I was listening to, and he he brought it up in a couple of the games he did, was that you have to go back when you're a player. You have to go back to from professionally, probably back to single A to when you're playing in front of almost no crowds or, you know, or very few people or even high school where you just have limited number of people there. Right. And so they're used to it, but I'm sorry, you're, you're a pro go out and play ball. It doesn't matter. You've had all this time playing in, in your stadiums without anybody there doing intra-squad games and stuff like that. You know what it's going to be like to me. It seems like, you can focus more on the game. And that was not what was happening, at least from what I saw with the Angels. And and I felt like on that that first game, I thought, man, we're in midseason form. We're right back to where we, we dropped off. And I kept looking when they showed the dugout. I kept looking to see that broad, um, Brad Osmus was back in the dugout and Joe Madden's out in his van somewhere because it didn't <laughs> feel like anything new. Well, and I saw, too, on the baseball Twitter uh, that some some angry, oh, he's just like, uh, Madden's um, managing like Sosha, which I thought more like, okay, but my Sosha was a good manager, but, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm not, um, but yeah, it was, but it was the same, the same thing. They, you're not seeing anything new, you know, like this infusion of, of new ideas or new ways to play or um, to do things. So, so yeah, that's when the world but, is falling. The sky is falling Friday night. The world is over. Let's fast forward to Saturday. I didn't watch the game on Saturday. Okay. Well, let me tell you, <laughs> let me tell you that some things changed and here's, here's the one thing pitching wise, the relievers, were were not good. Noe Ramirez has become the Yimmy Garcia when we talk about Dodgers and and that Noe Ramirez was just so bad. And the kid that came in, Hobie Milner, who gave up the Grand Slam, he pitched in AAA last year. So I'm not going to give him too much, but the pitching staff I have, especially the bullpen, I have real issues with. The lineup, which should be a little better than it was, I'm reserving judgment through the weekend. In my head, I'm saying, until Anthony Rendon comes back and we get him in there and we start getting a real good flow of things, I can't judge this. Go to Saturday, even Sunday, the bats pick up a little bit, better games, but better was Dylan Bundy, who was, who had a tough year in Oriole with the Orioles last year, comes in, pitches fantastically, to the point that Bob Melvin, the A's coach, said he kept us kept us off balance. He was very complimentary about Dylan Bundy. Uh, people said he looked like Greg Maddox. Wow, the way that he was pitching. Nice so compliment. I mean, yeah, exactly. And so they looked at, and at that point, it was like, good, we picked up somebody. And now, obviously, it's one start, but he looked good. And I and I wondered, and we talked about this, you know, early on. Would Dylan Bundy uh, be in a better position with the Angels, a different team, different ballparks, you know, overall? a different field, Joe Madden, uh, Mickey Calloway, who, uh, you know, has been a pitching coach and a manager, you know, working with them. So they looked pretty good that day. At that point, it, it was still pretty quiet with the bats overall. You know, Mike Trout hadn't really done anything. David Fletcher hadn't done anything. There was some pieces here. Andrelton Simmons, first couple of games, had some issues with his glove, bobble in the ball. There were some little issues here and there that were kind of surprising. Tommy Listella was great to start off with. Sunday, David Fletcher, four for four, comes out, gets the hits. Mike Trout, first couple of times up, he got a base hit. Then he flied out, to sacrifice fly to center for the first run scored. Then a three-run homer, his very first homer ever hit on a 3-0 and count. 
because normally he lets that ball go, but he hit that home run. And so he picked it up. And it's kind of funny because I, I said right before he came up, I said, I need you to be the MVP right now. <laughs> and he was. And he hit the three-run homer. One thing I, I, you know, you mentioned David Fletcher, he went four for four, but in the other two games, he was one, uh, one for three with two RBIs, went one for four with one RBI. So it was six for 11 and he's at third because Rendon's not there. Where's he going to fit in when Rendon does come back? Well, he played, he played second base the first night. Oh, right. And yeah. Tommy LaStella played third. Joe Madden is a fan. And we'll have him out there somewhere because he can play the outfield. So Justin Upton was the DH one day. They've, they've been using Taylor Ward, who's done well this season. He's been on it. Last season, I wasn't too sure about him. Now they're trying to use him in different places and make him more of a utility guy. So we'll have Fletcher and maybe Taylor Ward to be our Chris Taylor, Kike Hernandez guys, you know. So they, you know, they've got different places for him to play. So we're going to try to get him out there every day. I wouldn't, Tommy LaStella played pretty well overall. Mm -hmm. Once Rendon's back in there, you know, full time, I'm sure there'll be days. They may even use Rendon as a DH, maybe even towards the beginning of his coming back. So they're going to find a way to, to put him in there every day. Brian Goodwin had a decent series overall. Sunday, though, the wheels really came off the bus, and I feel like most of us had too high of expectations, simply because everybody kept hearing the news, Shohei's ready, the layoff helped him. We know from 2018 spring training, he didn't pitch well in spring training, but he pitched well during the season. During the intra-squad games, he pitched really poorly. I think I heard Ron Darling even mention that Ron Darling said, I led the league in walks one year. And you know how hard it is to walk nine players on 50 pitches? So he was off. You could see when I went back to look at it, at, while it's happening, I'm losing my mind. Because <laughs> he faced six batters. And while he was in, four runs scored. And then Matt Andres, who we just got this for this season comes in and is able to get a double play ball. Unfortunately, that scored a run. So all but one of the A's runs were attributed to Shohei Otani, who took the loss. He didn't even make it through the first inning. He got no outs. He just was off. And you could see, and I haven't read it yet, but I know there's a couple of stories about what do they call it, mental abrasion or something like that. That's that's doing and and he hasn't pitched in a couple of years, but I could see more what was happening when I went back and looked and just watched to see how he was pitching, where the balls were, what was going on. You could tell he wasn't himself afterwards because he was he's really quick to smile most of the time. But what we did find out is, is that Matt Andres comes in, pitches well, shuts down the A's, and the Angels work had to dig themselves out of a five nothing hole and got to five to four, thanks to to Trout and uh and his three run homer. And then you know that was pretty much it. They couldn't they couldn't get anything else really going, and then uh, you know they gave up a home run. The, the Angels gave up a home run, and they lost six to four. At that point, it didn't really matter if you you know you couldn't get it. But I I was surprised, and this turned my initial issues with them around was that once they get better flow, especially with that lineup, how they're hitting, probably going to be good getting out of Oakland for. You know, that's that's a it's a tough place to play uh, because of the way the wind blows, because of the you know, there's all those things. So it's like once they get out of that, get back home, maybe that'll help or or yeah. play in, in a couple of the other stadiums that might might help it. And, you know, it's too. We'll talk about, uh, you know, playoffs soon, but they're no they're not in any worse position than any other team. They just have to win, you know, like anything, you got to win more than you lose. And, you know, they're just, they're in the middle of the pack with everybody else. I think with Otani, you know, there was a lot of, 
you know, he's back. He's going to pitch there. It was exciting. He was going to be back right. pitching. He hadn't pitched since September 2018. But he said that he felt like it wasn't so much mechanics, but he has to get the feel for the game back. Because he said when he was on the mound, he felt like he was just throwing the ball. He wasn't pitching. That's a big difference when you're just throwing. And obviously, five runs shows that. Yeah, he has a. He says he has a little rust. He probably has uh, a little more than a little. A few. <laughs> um, but he's got to get to the point where he is. He's pitching the ball, not throwing the ball. And there's Which a I think lot is a the, good observation on his point, you know, for him to say no, that. No, that's good that he's he's trying to figure out what's going on with him. There are there were a few of the different pitchers uh, on like MLB and and other places I read. A lot of them feel like that he, because he wasn't throwing his normal fastball is above 95. He was throwing in the low 90s for the most part. I think the fastest pitch he threw was 94. That his arm maybe not as strong as it should be. They say a lot of players that come back off of Tommy John throw harder than they did before. So there's some of those things. I'm sure there's mental aspects to it. He's got to get himself in the right place. We know what he can do. And that's always the problem is that once you've set the standard for yourself, not that anybody else set it, but once you put yourself in that spot that this is what I can do at a minimum, everybody expects that every time. Yeah. And it's hard to give him a break. And that was the problem. Like I said, though, what good came out of it is Matt Andres is is going to be a good pitcher. And it's another one of those pickups. Now, you know, it's a matter of getting Julio Tehran. Uh, ready to pitch. It's having him, Bundy, and Andres there along with Griffin Canning. Shohei gets starts on Sunday. Let's see what happens. You know, how how it works out. And if if it happens again, maybe you got to look at putting him on as the DH and letting him continue to, to rehab, continue to work that and build up that arm. Angels just have to realize that this first few games, Okay, work out your kinks, but you don't have much time after that. I think, too, for the Angels, what's going to help be helpful, um, because I'm a big Joe Madden fan, but I think it's going to be really helpful for those guys to have him as their manager at this point, especially during this odd season where it is 60 games. Um, And also, you know, for a pitcher like Otani, he... You talked about the mental adhesions. I think that was a Joe Madden phrase. And he said he's seen this before. So, you know, I think, and he's a positive guy. He's, you know, he wants the players to to do well. He cares about his players. So I think that's good for the Angels. And yeah, I mean, the first outing against the A's wasn't great. There, But there were bright spots. And that is better. I mean, it, it's better I didn't that see any bright you see. Spots. <laughs> yes, you did. You saw David Fletcher. Oh, you saw... <laughs> I thought you meant with Shohei. No, there were no, no, no bright spots. I mean, overall, yeah, yeah. Because if you saw if everything was bad, then <laughs> everything yeah, was no, darkness. I, I never. But there were bright spots. I I didn't and and honestly I think that probably us doing this the podcast helps but I'm I have had times where I'm watching a game and I know you've done this it gets to a point where you're like I can't even watch this anymore and you turn it off and you go stomp around the house for a little while and then you think about it you go I'm going to turn it back on no and then you're mad for a bit then you try watching it and and if they're winning you're like yay I'm back in it until they start losing again or yeah. or if they're still losing you go fine screw you guys I'm not watching today well and Sunday night's game that. and I was stay I stayed right in there right till the end because that's what a fan does. And if right. I was at the game, I would stay there. I don't leave at the seventh inning no. after I showed up in the fifth inning. I'm, <laughs> I, I don't, I'm there. And the one thing was, and like I said, I went back and watched again. Shohei hasn't got what they would call a case of the yips. He hasn't lost it all. 
He's just not putting it all together. So we got to watch that. The other players, they're going to come to, they're going to come together. The hitters will hit. You got guys who can do that. The guys who, who haven't been hitting, if they continue not to hit, that's where we have to look at it and go, it wasn't happening here. It's not happening now. It's not going to happen. And we need to look at how do we replace those guys. But, you know, it's like Mike Trout didn't have two good games. Doesn't mean he's not going to still end up in the MVP conversation. Right. You know, he's he's that kind of player. The guys who do will do. The guys who don't, they may have a good thing here or a good thing there. That's just how the Angels, you got to look at it. You got to look at any of those. And just like we saw with the Dodgers, they came out playing like that team that you knew they were. And they ended up playing like a team that you were like, who are these guys? These yeah, guys. I, I was, right. And I was just thinking, you know, of another, I guess, an analogy of, you know, if you go to Ikea and you buy the furniture and you get it out and you put it back together, but then you move, but you don't want to take it apart because you're afraid you won't be able to get it put back together. It's kind of like. So the Dodgers, you know, the first game, that piece of furniture was all together. And the, la the last two games, they ha it was falling apart. And then Sh Shohei Otani, too, he really was taken apart. And now he has to get himself put back together. So I was thinking of Ikea furniture <laughs> as the analogy there. Yeah, he's not, uh, but he's not from Sweden or wherever he's Ikea. He's not, but still... <laughs> Maybe there's a place like that in Japan. Maybe, I don't know. maybe there is. Now, <laughs> so, you know, like anything, there's a lot to go. I was ready. I, I was ready Friday night to, like, have a live show so we could talk about everything because I was just <laughs> fired up. And as the weekend went, I was, I was good. A couple things, Angels, just, just because what gee whiz things. Albert Pujols became only the fifth player to be on an opening day lineup for 20 straight seasons. His first, wow. first 20 seasons. Wow. Not just 20 seasons total. His first 20 seasons, he oh, he joins Pete Rose, Carl Yastrzemski, Eddie Murray, and Frank Robinson as yeah, the only other. company. Only four, four other, all, and, and, you know, he's going to be a Hall of Famer. So four other Hall of Famers, he joined that group. And then with, uh, with Trout starting his 10th season, he is now eligible to be on the Hall of Fame ballot. Yeah, which we know will, will happen. He'll be there too. Well, you know, when you think about it, Albert Pujols did most of his, the biggest part of his Hall of Fame resume is the first 10 years of his career. Mike Trout kind of fits in that as well. So if Mike Trout finishes this season, says, I'm not going to play anymore, which I doubt because he's got yeah. all that money. You got to take care <laughs> of that kid that's coming next week or two weeks or whenever he'd be, he'd be in too, even with that. Cause he met that, uh, met that requirement. So the angels do have a chance like anybody else. And there are bright spots there. And if they can put it all together, if Joe can work his magic as the VP of stuff on this team, <laughs> the angels, could be a playoff team. So we know where the Dodgers were. We know where the Angels were, what looked good, what didn't look so good. There were a lot of other games. Let's see, that's two. So there were 13 other games going on at times with 28 other teams. And there was some impressive feats for opening day for the rest of the league. One thing that I did notice, and I meant to mention this before, was how many times did I see the little box of this guy in July does this? He's great in July or he's bad in July. And I was like, really? <laughs> Apples and oranges. Yeah, We're, those stats aren't going to matter. <laughs> and number two, this is like opening day. This should be more like in April or the end of March. He does this. Let's let's try to get the same equivalency there. That was the thing that kind of threw me off. Well, we were all happy that with Justin Turner because he normally he does not hit a home run until 
after. Maybe. You know, it's like May, June. Last, he, season, last season was the first time he had hit a home run in April. Yeah. So we're past that. So now he should be he should be hitting him out of the park all yeah, day. <laughs> should be constant. You know, some of the things that that we were looking at, John Carlos Stanton from the Yankees, two different home runs that were monster shots there in D.C. And it, he looked like the guy that the Yankees signed, not like the you know, he's been injured for the most part for the last two seasons. He he came in there and the Yankees looked good. They the did. Yankees, even though, and that's another team. We talked about the Dodgers. The Yankees are the other team that you would have expect to come out of opening weekend undefeated. And they lost one, um, you know, the first night out on opening night, Scherzer looked pretty good. He looked better than the score. And, and that indicated because he lost four to one, but he struck out 11 in five innings and got the complete game. Because the game ended right there after that. The rain. Did you see that? The rain was pouring down so hard. It was pushing the seats down. Yeah, it was coming down hard. And I have to say, I, it was so funny. I saw this. The I look at the box scores and it said CG. And I'm like, what the heck is CG? I don't, what's CG? Oh, and then it dawned on me complete game. I was like, duh, but you don't see that. And so Max Scherzer and Garrett Cole both have complete games for the 2020 season. And, and that they, might be the only time they have a complete game. I don't know. <laughs> could be. For this Maybe, season. Right. That um, They both looked really good. Garrett Cole was kind of, for me anyway, his performance was like kind of quietly excellent. I didn't take a lot of notice at was there wasn't any big giant pitch where you were like, Oh my God, what, you know, and, and, and yeah. I may have, and not, and not to say that I didn't look away and miss something, but I never really got that where was Scherzer, you know, and, and Scherzer's a much more emotional guy. Yeah. He's more demonstrative than Cole. So, but, but those, uh, you know, that started out, uh, you know, pretty good series Yankees were looking good the, the Nats didn't look bad but the Nationals you know they're without a lot of guys Rendon's gone so they don't have him uh Zimmerman not playing yeah. because he opted out uh Juan Soto wasn't uh, wasn't in there this weekend so a lot of their big names not in place but they you know they held the and they're they're still in everything after the first weekend the yankees nationals game season opener on espn drew an average of four million viewers that's the most watched regular season game on any network since 2011 so that wow. really tells you a lot about bringing sports back and for us having baseball back, it's like that Bud Light commercial, I think it is, where they're singing, you know, take me out to the couch, we'll watch racquetball. Everything, racquetball, <laughs> even football, baseball, yeah. racquetball. Yeah, but it was ex it's exciting to have baseball back. No, I, it was... you know, it, and when I heard it was coming back, it was like, eh, okay. But now that it's here and you see the plays, everything that you love about the game, all the nuances, intricacies of the game are there. And so it's good to have it back. But yeah, the one thing too about the pitchers, we, we talked about Scherzer and, and Cole with their complete games. We also saw big names. Um, Justin Verlander is out for at least a couple of weeks with the forearm strain. Corey Kluber is out with a shoulder strain. Steven Strasburg was scratched. I think he was supposed to start and he had uh, some nerve issues, I think, in his hand. Ken Giles um, had elbow issues. So yeah, four Strasburg big... had a nerve issue. That's what I read about that, too. Yeah, yeah. there was, was quite a few. Yeah, so... Corey Kluber, I watched them play, and I didn't realize it was only the first inning, but he was looking okay. I didn't really see, you know, any issues. And then, and then I went to look at a different game. I come back, they're like, oh yeah, Kluber's out. I kept seeing it, you know, run across the bottom of the screen on what I was watching on TV. And he, it'd been a, just over a year since he pitched. He pitched like last May of last year. I think so, so that yeah. on the other side of it though, you had like Shane Bieber from the Indians who struck out 14 yeah. and joined uh, Don Drysdale and Randy Johnson tied them as only the other you know as other two players who have done that 
and one off of tying Camilo Pasquale of the 1960 Senators, who did 15 uh, strikeouts, had 15 strikeouts on opening day. So there was some of that. Of course, Jose Ureña, who was supposed to start for the Marlins yesterday, tests positive for COVID-19, doesn't get the start. Yeah, and that will be interesting to see, too, because they went ahead and played that game. We'll see how that works out. But there's a lot of, you know, we talked about at the beginning, the social distancing, you know, no sunflowers, no spitty going on. And I do have to give the shout out to Bryce Harper, who best dressed opening day. Oh, yeah. And and there is a uh, a picture of him on our Twitter, of him showing up in his green suit with the Philly fanatic lining on the yes. in the jacket, and then uh, when he was playing, when he was uniformed during the game, he had fanatic cleats on. They were decorated up like that, white cleats with the colors. And then he always wears the headband. We took his hat off. His headband had the eyes of the fanatic. So he was yeah. channeling the fanatic on opening day. Yeah, he was. And on his cleats, they were even furry. So yeah, <laughs> he had the, was, the little furry. That was, he was you getting into the like? whole holiday spirit of opening day. opening day. You know what it kind of looked like? Remember in uh, my big fat Greek wedding? And she's got her wedding planning book. That, yeah. Somebody made, and it's got that wispy, <laughs> feathery kind of stuff on yes. the edges. That's what it kind of remind me of now that I think about it. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> so yeah. it was a good, it was a good opening weekend. A lot of things. I, Nelson Cruz had a seven RBI game. Right now he's on. He's got ten RBIs over over the opening weekend. So that would put him on. At that point, he was on pace for about 200 RBIs in the 60-game season. <laughs> and uh, a couple of these players, you know, if you look at, like, John Carlos Stanton, he keeps hitting home runs the way he is. He's going to probably have 60 and 60. Yeah, definitely. And, the way we swing that bat. And then we have another trivia question has been answered. First NLDH home run. You don't know? <laughs> Jonas Cespedes. Oh, of yeah, of course. And he had now, a big game. There are, there are DHs. There have been home runs by DHs from National League teams in interleague games. But this was the first time when the Braves and the Mets met up, the first DH and a National League game. So Cespedes is the answer to that trivia question. We know Otani's the first. Simeon's the first to score. And there were a few other, there were four or five extra inning games. You actually had in Tampa, the Rays and the Blue Jays, you had two innings starting out with players on second base. Now, what I'm worried about with that, just briefly, is that I'm starting to hear guys who are traditionalists say, eh, I don't know. That's not that bad. I will say... Yeah, I didn't even think about it when when they started out. Once they got into play, I didn't think about that Shohei was just put on second. I just got into the game of what was happening. But I'm still not a fan. Yeah, that's something that can stay for the uh, 2020 season, definitely. Some teams don't have any stolen bases. The Padres have seven in this wow. opening day and the new park globe field must be a tough place to hit because the rockies and the rangers combined for 13 runs in three games at the new globe life field which is an odd it looks odd outside and it looks odd inside <laughs> when they were just showing pictures of it at the beginning inside it looked really nice now that they're playing games there i I don't want to. What watch. is it? And you know what? <laughs> the one of the things is, and they probably did it on purpose, but the backdrop doesn't. It looks like you're back in the batting cages under the under the stadium, the way the backdrop. But the it also looks like. Remember, they used to do what they called letterbox movies, and the top and the bottom are they're, yes. they're black bars across the top, and the movies in the middle. It looks like that because the the upper part above the opening. 
the netting or whatever that's there for where the fans can sit, where George Bush and Laura Bush are sitting next to Yvonne Rodriguez in his catching gear. The top part of it looks like it's like a blacked out bar and it has advertising on it. So they did that on purpose. So when the camera's in there, they've got some place to put that. And it just, and I know it's because it looks different than almost every other field, but even when you see other parts of the field, it looks wrong. Yeah, it's, and I'm not sure who they had as their architect on this one. Do they know what baseball is? Right, it's just something like, maybe, <laughs> maybe they, they were really, from Sweden. <laughs> maybe, this is, it's an Ikea stadium and somebody put the, the Eichelsflagen in the wrong, or <laughs> whatever, you know, they That's call right, those the wrong weird spot. parts. In the right, the, they put the B where the when the C was supposed to be, and the, yeah, it just it just looks odd. Yeah. Uh, so and Which it took a while to get any home runs there. I think Trevor Story hit a couple of home runs there. He did. Yeah. So. Yeah. Christian Yelich one for thirteen. I mean, his yeah, one he, was a say, home run. His Bob Euchre impersonation. Yeah, he continued to do that. He I was doing Bob that during was summer warm up. But yeah, but he was continuing the Bob Euchre impersonation uh, during opening uh, weekend. So now we said that there are, this was a season of what ifs. And we know that there would, could be crazy things with the rules, the, the runner at second base. I don't know about you, the three batter minimum for pitchers. I haven't noticed it much, but there were a couple of times where I thought this would have been a point where you would have pulled that guy to to bring in somebody else. Yeah. Uh, but it didn't, it, 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 there was only once or twice that I saw games where it seemed like it actually wasn't working because the pitcher was having a hard time and he was going to have to. Uh, the the last, uh, the when Gratterall came in, I felt like I blinked and he had gone through his three. Yeah. And it was already out. With that in mind, there were a couple of things that I saw that were really cool in this what if season number one on sunday's rays blue jays game g-man Choi, who is a lefty goes to the plate to hit right-handed now this is the first time he's ever hit right-handed in a game hits a home run incredible because when you think about it this isn't something that you do switch hitting is not a big deal anymore and I haven't seen all the details about it. I need to go back and look at it. But if your coach sends you up there, the manager sends you up and says, hey, why don't you bat righty? Because it was one of those things. It was a left-handed pitcher. But he, he comes in there having not hit outside of maybe a practice and hits a home run like it's nothing. <laughs> he should that bat was, right-handed more often. <laughs> that was incredible. And then the other thing that I thought was really cool and I brought this term up a little bit ago in regards to Shohei Otani. And it's a it's a term that applies to one of your favorite baseball players, the yips. Which for people who don't know what the yips are, it's like a complete loss of skill. Of, you know, it's like going to your job that you've been doing for 20 years and all of a sudden you just don't know how to do it. You can't figure out your your mechanics are all off. You're uncoordinated with it. Steve Sachs. I didn't want to say through the yips. He did. Now, the cool part and the reason I bring this up was that and we were talking about the uh, the Colorado Rockies kind of to the side because we were talking about the new stadium in Texas, Globe Life Field. Not to be confused with Globe Life Park, Globe Life Field. The Rockies were there for the opening series. And Daniel Bard, pitcher for the Rockies, last game he pitched was in April of 2013. He had, he was actually coaching the d back skills coach and like a pitching mentor uh, last season. Able to make his way back and wins his first game in seven years. Overcoming the yips. Grinning ear to ear, and he told Bud Black, the Rockies manager, that was fun. He's recovered from that. You figure seven years ago was the last time he pitched. He was off to coaching, 
and he comes in and he beats the Rangers three to two. He gets that W. Yeah, and he threw 20 of his 25 pitches were for strikes, and he hit 98 miles per hour on four of his fastballs, and he's 35 years old. And he's a relief pitcher. Yeah. He only pitched like one and a third innings. The, for, the last time that he got a win was May 29th of 2012. And he started for Boston, went five and a third, beating Justin Verland. Yeah. So uh, congrats to Daniel Bard. That's the feel-good story. Uh, as Rex Chapman would say on Twitter, that's the content I'm here for. That was that was pretty incredible. When I saw that, when you romanticize baseball, those are the things. It wasn't G-Man Choi hitting a head, although that's very cool. It's the comeback of a guy who had lost all of his skill and it's got to be a mental thing, it seems, only to come back to have the success in what is sure to be the strangest season ever. And that'll do it for this week's Sibling Rivalry Baseball Podcast. Remember, you can find us on our website, SiblingRivalryBB.com, and on Facebook and Instagram at SiblingRivalryBB. We're also on Twitter at SiblingRivalryBB without the A. Email us, show at SiblingRivalryBB.com. We'd love to hear what you think, so subscribe and rate us wherever you listen to our podcast. Join us next week on Sibling Rivalry Baseball as we look at the playoffs and we shake up the Magic 8 Ball. And I can't wait for ESPN to ask Josh Fields about his favorite yoga position. You're out!